Welcome to a radio documentary produced by students from UCFB Wembley called After Chloe's Moment. I'm Charlie Hunt and I'm talking to you today from Hanwell Town Football Club, where QPR FC women are about to play AFC Wimbledon in the third round of qualifying for the Women's FA Cup. A hero returned home. On August 6, 2022, lifelong QPR fan Chloe Kelly returned to Loftus Road after her heroics at this summer's Euros, as she etched her name into the history books of the women's game. That's because she'd helped the Lionesses do the unthinkable. Becoming European champions at Wembley Stadium, with households and pubs up and down the country erupting as Kelly pounced on a bouncing ball in the German six-yard box to poke home the winner and enter football folklore. This has put the QPR FC women's team firmly on the map because Chloe grew up in West London, making a name for herself in the QPR youth system, and played for the R's just a few years ago. And as Sammy Silly reports, Chloe described the goal post-match as her Zamora moment. Eight years earlier, Bobby Zamora did the same, scoring a famous winner at Wembley, though this time it was for QPR, of course. It's an In the final minute of the 2014 Championship Playoff Final, with the score at 0-0, Bobby Zamora scored one of the biggest goals in QPR history. This goal inspired many, but none more so than a 16-year-old girl in the Wembley crowd that day. She is one of our own, Chloe Kelly! Chloe's old youth coach Steve Quashy knew that one day Chloe would amount to great things, but none could have prepared him for the sheer power of the moment that would come and the impact that it would have on QPR's women. I was actually hosting um, a family get together, um, so unfortunately I couldn't attend the game just the way it worked out. But I was doing that and, and watching the game on the TV, and then when she scored, a guy jumped up, and I think I damaged the ceiling as a result of celebrating. But yeah. <laughs> While Chloe may not be a QPR player anymore. One of her childhood friends, Gabby Bishop, has recently rejoined the club where football began for the two of them. Gabby left the Rangers youth set up to play for West Ham and has played abroad in America and Georgia. But she's never forgotten her journey that started in West London. Since about like primary school, I would say, the first one of the first encounters I had on her was... I, th- I, I don't even know what year group it was, to be honest, but it was in primary school and it was a football game and I played against her. And then it was that she like my first memory of her was that she she scored a goal from her own box. I've known her for like quite a long time and known her through most of her like transitional phases to from coming from like QPR and then going to to Arsenal and then we were in the same um, like sixth form class as well, and that was when she kind of made the like the big transition and big step to actually go like full time into the Arsenal first team and I always knew from that moment that she was going to be going on to something special. Both players have taken different journeys through football and while Chloe may be known as a national hero now her moment of magic is shared by women and girls across the country. Chloe began her footballing journey in the street cages of Hanwell. The youngest of seven children, she learnt her competitive edge from her five brothers, just a matter of miles away from her beloved Loftus Road. The then girls youth coach, Steve Quashy, didn't know great talent was so close until one day, an eight-year-old Chloe joined the youth development programme at QPR. Chloe came in into our girls development programme, which was in Warsaw on a Friday evening. Um, at the time, she was an under eight. and. We always knew she came from a strong QPR family. She turned to the training sessions with her QPR wristbands on and, and just loved the club and always speak about the club. You know, and then when she progressed into our under-10 team, that's when her footballing ability was there for it all to see. She played years above her age, years above her chronological age. We did training sessions where we integrated under-10s to meet the under-14 players. And at that time, Chloe was better than some of our under-14s. I'd say she was actually technically better than most of our under-14s. A flash report by the FA, two months on from the Euros final, revealed that there has been over 400,000 new opportunities created for women and girls to access grassroots football. Not just our squad, but the whole football club, because this year when we had our girls girls summer trials, we had record numbers across the days that we hosted them. And then for the senior trials, 
again, we had record numbers because a lot of players saw the interest that was generated, saw that a lioness started a journey at QPR and it generated lots of healthy, healthy interest. Participation at grassroots and lower league levels hasn't been the only aspect of women's football that's increased. In 2022, professional and semi-professional following within women's football has increased by 8.7 million on 2021. Now with um, all the kind of, I guess you'd say, like hype um, that came from the women's winning the Euros and everything, and especially with with how like inspirational they were to the younger girls and everything that's just within football and, and all that kind of stuff. We definitely do like bode a different kind of responsibility on our shoulders, especially as well being at like QPR, such a like respected and well-known club too. There's no doubt that women's football is on a very positive trajectory at the moment. Whether it's mandatory PE lessons in school or increased funding for academies, there are many ways to encourage further participation amongst young girls. One thing is for sure is that the momentum must be capitalised upon and to ensure that clubs can find the next Chloe Kelly. The only way is up for the R's women's side and the future is very exciting. Steve Quashy is focused on taking the team to the next level and has done so since he arrived. And back here in Hanwell, ironically where Chloe grew up, Steve's team is about to start their match with AFC Wimbledon. I can see him right now on the touchline with the opening whistle just seconds away. But, as reporter Hamish Thorpe explains, women's football in QPR has a history all of its own. And some of it will be very, very unexpected to R's fans. I'm currently stood in the stands of Champion Hill Stadium, home to Dulwich Hamlet. It's a small stadium located in East Dulwich with a capacity of 3,000. Now, you're probably wondering, why am I standing in this cold and empty ground in the south of London? Let's take it back to a gloomy Saturday in 1977, where a QPR women's team were facing off against the five-time FA Cup champions Southampton to try and become the first London club to win the FA Women's Cup. Women's football was on the rise after the 50-year ban on the women's game had been lifted. Now, here's the twist. This ladies team were not actually affiliated with QPR, but were a group of fans that went off their own backs to create a side to compete in the FA Women's Cup. It was set to be a tough day for the QPR ladies who the previous year had lost 2-1 in extra time to Southampton in the final. In true QPR spirit, the ladies were not phased by their opponents, nor the wet and windy conditions that engulfed East Dulwich on that day, and Carrie Staley gave QPR the lead within 25 minutes. The ladies held on to this lead and the game finished 1-0, leading to jubilant celebrations and the QPR ladies writing the history books as the first London women's side to win the FA Women's Cup. A great story which highlights fans coming together to achieve a dream and write women's footballing history. That was then, but now the women's team is seeking more silverware as a fully affiliated part of QPR. And someone who's been there is Keisha Petit. I've been with the club since under 12, so just under 20 years now, um, going up through the youth system, through to under 18s and then trialling and getting into the women's uh, team as well, starting with reserves and, and breaking into the first team as well. What's kept me at the club for most of um, my career has been how my values line up with the clubs, so the community trust. I came through uh, at a young age as well when I was still in the youth team, started volunteering. Um, uh, on holiday camps and soccer schools and then eventually ended up getting my first job role um, with QPR Community Trust so I think I've grown a, a lot of um, respect for the club and the, and the passion has obviously clearly grown over time as well so for that reason I think it's been quite easy to, to grow towards it and, and get to know the fans and, and have that connection with it through not just 
personal and, and supporting the club, but also working for them as well. One of the main individuals behind the transition at the club has been the CEO of the Community Trust, Andy Evans. Andy is a lifelong fan who went to his first game at the age of four. Since first laying eyes on the blue and white hoops, he has lived and breathed the club. He has played a massive part in the transition of getting the ladies side from Hamwell Town to the iconic playing surface of Loftus Road. For us to stage a game here at the main stadium, I could see that the lift that, that, that gave the players in particular by being here at the stadium, playing in the stadium. And we had just under a thousand um, attend the game, which for us is, you know, it's probably six, seven times bigger than what we normally could get. So, you know, um, that, that was a great moment for the players. And I would say in recent memory, I would say that that, that Playing that game here recently against Norwich with, with a crowd here was excellent. Loftus Road is a dream of any QPR fan to play at. It provides an atmosphere like no other, and has seen legends such as Les Ferdinand, Alan McDonald, and Stan Bowles all call it home. But what does it really feel like to play at Loftus Road from a player's perspective? Obviously, the atmosphere of Loftus Road is, is pretty close. You're pretty close to the pitch, so. Finally getting onto it and being able to, um, you know, play on the hello turf as they say, um, in front of a good group of fans was was amazing. Something that you 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 kind of dream about for for quite a long time, but don't know if you're gonna quite get that opportunity. Um, when we were younger, we got we got the opportunity to train on it, but you don't really think that you're gonna get that opportunity to play in front of fans there. So it's an amazing opportunity, and it's just a it's a lovely pitch. From Loftus Road to Hamwell Town, a short journey across West London, as the current QPR team face AFC Wimbledon. Two very good saves from Katie McLean have kept QPR in this game so far. And this is, of course is the current team, and they have their own stories that capture the reality of playing in women's football today. We caught up with players at the photo shoot for their new kit, as Theo Hunt reports. The QPR women's team currently play in the FA Women's National League, Division 1 South East, with the club achieving a fourth place finish last season. However, with similar clubs going from part-time to full-time professionally, this is something that QPR would like to achieve in the future. First team coach Steve Quashy is a big advocate for this change. Well, we need a larger fan base, we need uh, more investment, and we need to just you know be mindful of some of the, the clubs out there that have thrown a lot of money into their women's programme without a sustainable vision, you know, for us to have a clear business plan, but at the same time just re remember and recognise that we are a West London club that aren't just about the success of the first team, it's having that community feel from bottom to top and top to bottom. By still being a part-time club, most players in the squad are balancing other priorities. The players have to balance employment, education, football, which is, yeah, as you alluded to, is very tough. You know, but for us, we just make sure that we've got um, an open door policy where players can speak to us about their demands, their schedules. Myself, and my colleagues, we, we tell the training sessions to make sure that they're not suffering with fatigue and burnout. So it's having regular interventions and having those professional discussions that help them understand what we expect from them and vice versa. With there traditionally being a lack of opportunity within the women's game, it has meant many women have had to delve into different cultures to succeed. Versatile midfielder Joe Blodgett knows this more than anybody. Absolutely could not view being football as an actual career. So in Canada and the US, a lot of football um, ambitions are geared around going to university. So unless you're good enough to be in the national team from, um, from a young age, you're more so working towards getting a scholarship to go to university, do your undergraduate degree. So I played football for five years at university in Canada, um, had a scholarship to do that. And it's, it's really competitive. It doesn't compare to university football in the UK. So we're training 
five days a week, playing one to two games a week. Um, you're training for two or three hours every single day and it's non-stop during season. Um, and with that, the girls are focused on training together and then you're, you've got so little spare time that it almost becomes not just your football teammates, but your study group, you're eating your meals, you're doing your gym, you're really just doing everything with your team. Many women who want to achieve their dream of making it pro choose to risk their bodies through vigorous training and strict regimes. I think my whole life I've been able to kind of pursue my academic career and then pursue my football and they've worked well together because it's quite busy, there's not a lot of time to be sitting around so I have to, you know, if I'm training I'm focused fully on training and then I need to focus fully on studying so I think I'm a bit more conscious of making sure that I'm structuring my day a bit better, so getting, getting sleep, eating well, working hard on the pitch, recovering. And it's not just Joe who has to make these sacrifices. It's the whole team, even including club captain Hayley Peacock. Everyone in the club is involved in something full time, whether that's like education or uh, through work. Um, and it is really, really difficult. I think people don't quite realise how much time and effort it actually takes, especially at the level that we're at. But once you get to tiers three and four, the training load increases, your expectation increases, the competition increases, and to keep up with the pack and with all the other teams that are training more often, you really have to put in like a lot of work outside of football. So yeah, pretty much like I'm working like nine till six every day, and then I will have like a quick break for my dinner. I'll go, at the moment I'm doing lots of rehab, so I'll spend two hours in the gym, and then I'll come back and it's basically bedtime <laughs> for me. So maybe finishing off a bit of work. So it begs the question, why do these women risk their physical and mental well-beings just for a part-time job? You're tired a lot of the time, but you're doing a sport that you love. You get to be with your friends and you're working towards a common goal. So yeah, we all, we all share the same struggle and I think that's why you know, we all kind of dig in really hard, but it's, it's a lot of work. It's hard for me personally with my, my job and I think a lot of people have this as well when like we do a lot of work with clients and they have like quite uh, you know high expectations especially in consultancy you might get an email being like oh we need this by 9 a.m tomorrow morning and i might have training it takes me two hours to travel to training as well from where i live so yeah i spend about i think my average week is like <laughs> it's it's quite depressing actually when you, when you put all the hours together uh, how much time you spend like just on a train but football's worth it and that's why we all do it The halftime whistle has just gone here. Uh, Steve Koshy side play FC Wimbledon. The score is currently 2 0 at half time. However, late chances in that first half have certainly boosted QPR's morale as they head into the second half. But whilst we're witnessing the team performing on the pitch, there is plenty going on off the pitch too, as the club tries to create a framework for the future. Andrew Long finds out more. The QPR women's team is not only growing on the pitch, but off it too with the Lionesses' inspiring victory sparking a huge new interest in the women's game. It's an exciting time for the club. Increased funding through the Empowering for Success strategy, as well as new sponsors coming on board, has led to improved infrastructure and better facilities for fans. QPR Women's General Manager Charlie Edwards has seen firsthand at the club the vast growth in all areas. QPR is known as a family club, as a community club. And that's certainly been, I've, I've been at the club nine years and it, it was hugely instilled in me when I first came. We're fortunate enough that, you know, the stadium is still within the heart of its community and that everything that we do is about community and community feel. People are asking, how do we buy the women's shirt? So our women's team is sponsored separately from our men's team. It's a different front of shirt sponsor. And people are asking about that. How do we buy season tickets for the women's games? So this is all good. And this has all come about since the summer. The growth in that time has been massive. And in the last five years has been massive. Um, and I think we have to keep going. Well, actually, yes, we have got a long way to go, but look at where we've come. Look how far we've come. And that's really important. Slowly with this new audience, with this new generation getting involved in the game, it can only do good things at the top level and at the bottom level. We're going in the right direction. The more sponsorship, the more people that we can get involved in the game, that's what's going to help grow it and that's what's going to help keep these girls um, as professionals going forward. 
Charlie also acknowledges the players' roles in bringing the fans closer to the team. You know, they, they've had to go out and kind of earn their stripes. And that's why this, this familiarity with players, they, they can socialise very well. And that is important to us to come back to that feel of community and is the reason that we have a couple of sponsors, you know, on our shirt this year that, that we probably wouldn't have had if it wasn't for that community link and that community feel. And we start to get more people come to games. We start to get more media interest, etc, etc. And it begins to snowball. QPR regard the local community as being fundamental to the success of the club. This is shown by how the club have operated commercially in recent times. Andy Evans, CEO of the Community Trust, used his years of experience to maintain the special bond between the team and the fans. I've experienced nothing but growth in the game, both at community level in terms of the interest for the game from young girls in particular wanting to be involved in football and playing football. Towards the more elite end of it with our women's team, we've seen a steady, a steady improvement and growth there as well. What's happened during the summer uh, with the success of the Lionesses, it, it's really probably at its peak, um, but we've still got quite a long way to go in terms of in terms of developing our own particular club, the QPR women's team and the girls club as well. Andy also mentioned some of the big steps taken by QPR and what they plan to further evolve in the future. About four years ago, we took the decision that the QPR women's team would become part of QPR and the Community Trust. And it was at that point that our Vice Chairman, Kevin McGrath, took the lead on, on the women's team and set up a separate board for QPR Women's and Girls FC. So from a, from a strategic level, having uh, the Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees sort of taking the lead to help with the strategic direction of the club was like, that was a major, a majorly important step. I would say playing here at the stadium, the lift that gave the players in particular by being here at the stadium, playing in the stadium. That was a great moment for the players and we need to convert those, you know, those thousand that came on that day. We need to make sure a large percentage of those start going to the games at Hanwell where we regularly play. So uh, trying to build that fan base is key for us now. You know, engaging with the fans is, is really important to build that bond. The club is proud to partner with local charities and causes. Noah's Pink Balloon Leukemia Fund was set up in 2021 in memory of Noah Tesla, who sadly died of a leukemia-related infection. The charity looks to help fund medical research in order to prevent more young children from becoming seriously ill. When QPR heard about the charity, they wanted to help immediately. Susan Tesla, founder of the charity, outlines the importance of the partnership. As a charity, Noah's Pink Balloon Leukemia Fund supports the underfunded areas of leukemia research. We want to prevent what happened to Noah happening to others. Our aim is to get people healthy. We champion fundraising through sport. I think QPR women and Noah's Pink Balloon have a shared ambition for growth and change. We did a kickoff game quite literally to announce the partnership and we had some local children in the community releasing balloons at half time with a call to action to donate. I just would like to say I hope this partnership can inspire young girls to play football and will continue to raise awareness of childhood leukemia. Lots of great work has already been completed by the club yet they aren't just happy with what they have achieved so far. They're still hungry to push the boundaries of what's possible in women's football. So, we know how important a successful business plan is in the modern world of women's football. And we can see how QPR are planning for years to come. Community partnerships are going to be central to the growth of the women's team. But it's also important to find a new generation of players inspired by the success of the England team in the Euros. How are the R's going to find the next Chloe Kelly from West London? Patrick Frower looks for answers. Like the first team, the Women's Youth Academy receives all their funding from the QPR Community Trust in order to remain financially sustainable. The Trust recognises the power the football club has with regards to connecting with a range of young women and developing their understanding of the sport. 
Since 2017, there has been a 54% participation increase in FA-affiliated girls' and women's football teams across the United Kingdom. More importantly, how can QPR Women's Football Club reap the rewards of this significant growth? Andy Evans is CEO of the QPR Community Trust and is always looking for new ways that the Trust can further support the women's youth setup. We took the decision uh, three, four years ago to bring, bring the women's team into the Community Trust and following this summer we've now brought the girls set up into the QPR Community Trust as well. So that's meant that we've sort of supported the coaches uh, on the girls side with helping with their development, um, making sure that actually, you know, they're not just volunteers, that they're actually paid coaches as well. The Trust have big ambitions of working alongside the club by making use of state-of-the-art facilities to improve the quality of the women's first team and youth programme. In an ideal world, once the training ground is finished at QPR, which currently houses the boys' academy and the, and the men's first team, um, there's sort of three, three phases to that development. Uh, but once it's finished, we're hoping that the uh, girls and the women's team will, will be able to have access to the facilities there as well. Once these changes have been implemented, the impact of what the Trust sets out to achieve will only serve to develop the Women's Youth Academy and First Team. Hayley Peacock is captain of QPR Women's FC and sees the club as moving in the right direction with identifying the trajectory young players can take from the academy to the First Team. But it's, it's amazing to have a bit more of a clearer pathway from the youth teams up into senior. In our first season we were all training pretty much in the same venue at Harlington so the younger players the youth from the youth teams could see like the progression into the first team um, which was really good but when I was playing in the tier 3 version of QPR my first few seasons that progression wasn't there we weren't often getting um, players like younger players from the under 23s coming into our, our squad it was a bit too distant and now it's really connected which is just really good. Haley also recognises that there is ground to be made with regards to the opportunities for young girls in schools who have ambitions of becoming footballers. Some schools still, and I know that the Lionesses chatted about this a lot when they won the, the Euros, but some schools don't have football opportunities for girls. Um, or if they do, it's a mixed uh, opportunity and that you might be like, this happened to me and loads of other, other girls in the club as well, like you're the only girl there, or there's two other girls there. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's an intimidating environment for many people and it puts them off and they don't want to play anymore. So making it more open, more inclusive, more accessible and listening to what the, like, young people need in terms of having those, those kinds of sessions. Yeah, I, when I, I used to coach um, a girls team in East London and a few, so many of my players would come and say that uh, they had to lie to their parents and say they were playing tennis because football was not like an appropriate game for young girls and that's how it was viewed. And so we kind of had to like almost keep up with it because we want, they loved football so much but we were the only team that provided all female opportunities with like an all-female group, all-female staff that they felt comfortable in those environments and just making sure that that is something that's common across London because um, West London is like beautifully diverse and you want to make sure that you're, you're engaging with the people that live there as well. After the success of the Lionesses, PE students at UCFB Wembley in North West London conducted research for this documentary to analyse provisions at local schools for girls football. They interviewed 105 girls from three primary and three secondary schools and found that 67% of those interviewed wanted to play more football in general. But it appears obstacles still exist. Only 20% of girls take up the sport at primary school level, with only a quarter continuing to do so in secondary school. Researchers found that part of the problem is the way in which boys football overshadows the girls game as well as a lack of coaches willing to give their time to girls football. But there has been a huge increase in participation. More than half, 52%, played more football in schools, perhaps due to the exploits of Chloe and her teammates. The future for women's football is really positive and it's got you know, so much to do with the, 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 the women's England team winning the, winning the Euros. Uh, that's like been a, a huge step change in the game. Um, I remember when I was growing up, it was impossible to see women's football games. It wasn't advertised, there'd be one game on TV, which would be the FA Cup final. There was just wasn't enough um, effort put in by broadcasters to put women's football out on the map. Now it's changed massively. Um, you know, you can watch, you can, you can go to watch women's football games pretty much anywhere. You can see it on TV, there's like loads of like broadcasting rights and stuff. So yeah, it's, women's football broadly is really, yeah, it's come, it's come a long, long way.
Although the women's game is still a long way off reaching the participation numbers of the men's game, it's clear that the progression women's football has made over the last decade has been groundbreaking and can be typified by the successes of the Lionesses and Chloe Kelly. The final whistle has just gone here in Hanover, where QPR women have been defeated by AFC Wimbledon in the third round of qualifying in the Women's FA Cup. Just wasn't meant to be for the R's here today, but of course they'll be back in league action next week. Since that famous assassin eye at Wembley, when England won the Euros, over 400,000 new opportunities have been created for young girls and women to engage in the sport. And with media rights in the women's game having tripled in value since the Euros final, women's football has never been so popular. More high value investments are expected, so there's no doubt that Chloe Kelly's goal has, has been the trigger for a brighter future for the sport, and hopefully a brighter future for QPR women too. I'm Charlie Hunt, and this has been a production by second year broadcasting students at UCFB Wembley. <laughs> <laughs>